Welcome to the next video in the Maintaining a Balance series. So in this video, we'll be looking at two dot points, a theory dot point and a uh, secondary source investigation. So outline the role of the hormones aldosterone and ADH, which is, stands for antidiuretic hormone, in the regulation of water and salt levels in blood and present information to outline the general use of hormone replacement therapy in people who cannot secrete aldosterone. So just a reminder that hormones are substances that are excreted by our endocrine glands and they act on other parts of our body in order to carry out different functions. So the two hormones we'll be looking at in particular are aldosterone and antidiuretic hormone. So antidiuretic hormone's job is to decrease urine output. When the body is low on water, the hypothalamus, which is this section, tiny section of the brain, contains osmoreceptors that detect changes and causes the pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone or ADH. So the pituitary gland is a tiny pea-sized gland in the brain. So once the hypothalamus detects the change in the level of water, it stimulates the pituitary gland to release this hormone. So the ADH then increases the permeability of the tubules in the nephron so that they increase the amount of water that's reabsorbed and decreases the volume of urine being produced. So this helps to uh, restore the level of water in the blood by stopping it from being passed out in our urine. So water returns to the blood and the solute concentration decreases. And again, the hypothalamus detects this and therefore stops the pituitary gland from releasing ADH. A decrease in water in the blood also triggers the thirst response. So once we drink, there's no need for ADH to be uh, released and carry out its different functions on the nephron. Caffeine and alcohol are two uh, substances that are diuretics, so they inhibit the release of ADH. So ADH stops us from going to the bathroom when we don't need to. Diuretics such as caffeine and alcohol increase the amount of urine that we create, so we seem, well, we do pee more when we drink caffeine and alcohol. So this uh, image here shows the normal water levels in the blood. So just the key for the next couple of slides is the blue arrows show the water, the green arrow shows the ADH, and the yellow arrows show the urine. So we can see here we've got a steady amount of water. So we've got a steady amount of um, ADH in the blood, and our kidneys are producing a nice even amount of urine. However, if we have a decreased amount of water, so our water level is lower, the hypothalamus detects that there's too much water as seen by our small blue arrows. So the job is to release ADH. So our amount of ADH in our blood increases significantly. They make their way to the kidneys, act on the tubules, and less water is removed from the blood. So the urine becomes more concentrated. So this is, for example, when we're dehydrated. When we're dehydrated, our body works to draw as much of the water in, which uh, is a response to ADH being released and we only produce small amounts of urine and it's concentrated so it's got that dark yellow colour. Okay, so a person is thirsty and drinks more water. Uh, that helps to then increase the amount of water in the blood as well as the reduction in urine output and then all things come back to normal so the level of ADH stabilises. So what happens when we have higher levels of water in the blood? So you can see here nice big blue arrows, lots of water. You've been drinking regular, regularly during the day. So the hypothalamus detects that and st or stops the release of ADH or decreases. So as we can see, the amount of ADH in our blood is now low. Okay, so as a result, the kidneys remove wa more water from the blood. So more water is lost in the urine and the urine becomes more dilute or dilute, sorry. So um, when we go to the bathroom, we have a, a large volume of urine and it's a much lighter straw colour because there's a lot more water mixed in with the different substances that we're getting rid of. Okay, then once we get rid of all that water, our um, blood water levels return to normal and the amount of ADH in the bloodstream stabilises. So the second hormone that we need to look at is aldosterone. Aldosterone is produced by the adrenal glands, which are these two little uh, glands that sit on top of the kidneys, look a bit like kidney hats. 
a decrease in the blood volume causes a decrease in the blood pressure. So this is detected by receptors in the kidney and then the adrenal glands release aldosterone. So all of this takes place in the very small area. So the kidneys detect it, the adrenal glands are stimulated and they release the aldosterone. The aldosterone acts to control the reabsorption of solutes, in particular sodium, not actually the water. Okay, so that's one big thing that we need to note. ADH looks at reabsorption of water. Aldosterone is the reabsorption of sodium. So increased levels of aldosterone in the blood leads to increases in the permeability of the ascending loop of Henle and the distal tubule walls to sodium so that they can be reabsorbed into the body. The reabsorption of sodium also leads to water being reabsorbed because water follows salt by osmosis. So if salt, uh, sorry, if salt moves out of the kidney tubule into the blood vessels, there is much higher level of water in the nephron than in the, um, the capillary. So the water will move from the nephron into the capillary because there's a higher water concentration to a lower water concentration. When the water returns to the bloodstream, the blood volume increases and therefore the blood pressure also increases and the release of aldosterone is stopped. So we can see here that we have our nephron uh, with the distal tubule label. We also have our ascending loop of Henle is this part here. So ascending is going up. Okay, so in this particular picture, we have low sodium levels in the blood. So low sodium levels in the blood also lead to a decrease in the amount of water in the blood and therefore a decrease in both blood pressure and blood volume. So this is detected by the kidneys and they stimulate the adrenal glands to release the aldosterone. So once the aldosterone uh, does its job, the distal, uh, sorry, the ascending loop of Henle and the distal convoluted tubule both become more permeable to salt. So as we can see, the sodium and the chloride, most commonly the sodium is moving out of the nephron back into the surrounding tissues. Okay, so water follows the salt out of the distal tubule by the process of osmosis. So sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Inadvertently, aldosterone does work in uh, to help reabsorb water, but its main job is to reabsorb the salt. And then the water is just uh, tagging along through the process of osmosis. So because we're drawing water out of the nephron, there's a lower volume of concentrated urine produced. So the water is conserved in the body and not um, excreted in our urine. So when our, we have an increased level of salt in our blood, the blood volume increases and so does the blood pressure as the amount of water is also increased. So at this point, aldosterone is not released. And as a result, salt is then excreted in the urine along with uh, water. So water is not absorbed as much. So there's increased volumes of urine produced. So you will recall from the syllabus dot points that were at the beginning of the video that we need to also be able to have a look at the use of hormone replacement therapy for patients who cannot secrete uh, enough aldosterone. So this is known as Addison's disease and it's a rare chronic endocrine disease. So the reason it's an endocrine disease is because it's related to hormones in which the adrenal glands do not produce sufficient aldosterone. So it's sometimes also referred to as hypoaldosteronism. So hypo meaning low and obviously aldosterone. The condition arises from problems with the adrenal gland. Obviously is, this is where aldosterone is released from and can be caused by the body's own immune system attacking the adrenal glands, uh, certain infections or various rare cancers. Uh, Addison's disease is generally diagnosed by blood tests and medical imagery. Treatment involves the replacement of the absent hormones and lifelong continuous steroid treatment is often used with regular follow-up treatment and monitoring for other health problems. So some symptoms of Addison's disease can include high urine output because uh, the Addison, oh sorry, the aldosterone, remember, draws salt from the nephron and also takes water with it. So if that's not taking place, that excess water is being excreted. So we have a high urine output. And remember that if we get rid of lots of water, our blood volume and our blood pressure decreases. And some other symptoms can include fatigue, weight loss, uh, craving salty food, anxiety, lightheadedness, and the darkening of the skin. 
Treatment usually involves replacing or substituting the lost hormones. So daily doses uh, that are taken orally of uh, fludrocortisone acetate, uh, which are just tablets which uh, the patient takes every day during an adisonal adisonal crisis, which is a situation where uh, the symptoms are exacerbated or uh, exaggerated by quite a bit, patients can require injections of hydrocortisone saline and dextrose which is a form of sugar in order to help to balance the fluids and things within their body. Treatment will need to continue for the length of the patient's life and some side effects may result just a lot as um, sort of as with most of our treatments that we have these days unfortunately some side effects can result. The prognosis for people with Addison's disease is patients who undergo hormone replacement therapy are often able to maintain normal lives They've just got to make sure that they take their daily dose of their um, hormone replacement treatment. Otherwise, it could lead to life-threatening complications. So this picture down the bottom here is of the Kennedy family. So JFK, who was the president of the United States, uh, he actually suffered from Addison's disease. And obviously, that didn't have any real impact on his life as he was able to become the president. Uh, And it didn't really... Uh, Yeah, so it didn't really have a massive impact on his life. It would have uh, obviously meant that he had to take these daily doses of hormone replacement uh, therapy. However, it didn't stop him from becoming the president. And that's the end of this video. Thank you.